So at this point, can we ask Nick, Charlotte, and Daniel to join Mark here and we'll do a little discussion with our remaining time. All right, so our first question for everyone is, um, so we've learned so much here about everything's about the materials, there's techniques and post-processing. What would it take to reprint something at a later time that is identical to the original object? Um, I can, uh, from my perspective on this, so most of my job is 3D printing with custom materials and custom systems. So this is something that we've had to deal with when we send work to museums. If you really want to 3D print the exact thing that came out of the machine, you need to actually have the machine code that was sent. So that has to include the positioning of the extruder, if it was heating things, what temperature did it heat to, um, if it was curing things, what was the wattage of the laser. You need to have all of that information so that you can get the same object out of the, the 3D printer. More challengingly, you need to know exactly the post-processing steps that were taken. And since most post-processing is not fully automated, you're not necessarily going to be able to recreate that. You just have to talk to the people who did it. Um, and then the other thing is material stocks. So a lot of commercial material stocks, while you might be able to buy the same thing, a lot of these companies, they're quickly emerging and going out of business. So if you know the chemical combination, maybe you can find something similar, uh, but otherwise you're, you're gonna have a challenge of recreating that. What I would advise as a designer from this perspective is less to think about recreating the exact object and more to understand what the intent of that object was and whether or not you can create something that serves the same function, looks to embody the same sort of process, et cetera. But I would be curious what others um, would say on that too. Yeah, you're right, Nick. It's like a, a huge thing, like reproducing uh, 3D objects. That's why I, I force all the time my, my artists, they work with me to go a step further and go from 3D printed object to a cast or something. So most of the time, you know, I, I did like um, last month, like 18 births um, and um, they're like now in bronze and not in like a, a 3D printed material. Of course, we did like the 3D scanning, then the printing in, in wax for casting so 3D printing was totally involved, but we went one step further because still like uh, 3D print material, uh, we experienced that at the ETH a lot. Um, they are not stable, um, even if they're, they're come out of, of a production line. So also with the, um, the project, we had some color changes uh, in normal cartridges. So it was like crazy how much the, the prints were like changing color in one on the other direction, getting darker or, or less darker. It was like a, a, just a game with the, with the material and also the settings uh, for the print. Even everything was like the same print file wise, the machine was doing just uh, weird things. And uh, I think that's also with the, with, with other printing methods, especially FDM uh, uh, printers, they're also, they're not totally stable uh, how they build, you know, even because you have like most of the time, you have not um, the air or the, the room around the printer is not totally controlled like temperature wise. So um, you have warping and uh, like the warping, the mean it deforms during um, the cooling process. And it's, it's really hard with all these 3D prints to get totally the, the exact um, print two times, especially after uh, a lot of time, you know, when you get in again. Um, we also like uh, tried there like an old machine just to get like the same than before, but it was not possible. It was like just, um, again, you know, we spent, I don't know how many weeks we were like trying again and again to match the colors uh, from one object. And I think it's, uh, it's the goal is like to match the look of uh, the, the art piece and also there, you know, like when you have an art piece that was like 
fading to yellow or in a different way um how how do you um react to that you know so do you start with the total yellow uh, total white piece again or you just like try to match the yellow so if you add something that was like broken to a existing piece um we did that too we try to match the yellowness of of the rest of the print just to to get like a, a total piece again so I think it's it's a uh, it's a big topic, and I think uh, especially from your side um, in the in a conservatory um, thinking, uh, it's it's hard to to um, to make this decision and then match uh, the goal that you want to reach. I was really struck by again uh, Charlotte mentioning that there's a move from 3D printed prototypes as to 3D printed products. And I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts on that as well. I think we, um, uh, to, to kind of uh, continue on a little bit from the um, first conversation was um, the fact that the um, objects that were made 10, 20 years ago are probably gonna be very different material-wise in terms of ingredients and formulations than what we have now. So um, maybe being an optimist, uh, we would be able to print, uh, reprint perhaps an object with a more stable materials as um, things progress uh, forward. But we have to keep that in mind, you know, is this now a replica? How do we treat this object? Is it, do we treat it as an original? Do we um, display it side by side with the original? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, being, uh, if you have ways of documenting the object once you have in the collection, um, not just, um, you know, um, collecting the, the computer files, but also uh, doing what we did at LACMA, um, putting it under the microscope, um, having a conservation photographer taking really good pictures. If you have a 3D scanner, that's even great because then you have, um, it's a little bit inception wise, but scanning your object. Um, so things like that, that, that might um, help. And, and I do hope that um, as more and more folks, um, you know, get into additive manufacturing, that the materials that will be available will be more, um, more stable. Muted, sorry about that. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Can you find the artist's fingerprint in either the files or the prints? So what kind of like artist, uh, I guess like hints or references to an artist's specific style or flourishes? I uh, understand that post-processing can obscure this if something's been sanded, et cetera. But uh, I don't know, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that there's certain styles that you come across that you can find? So I worked on um, an object by uh, a very well-known uh, sort of architect who worked with sort of these uh, futuristic or speculative um, architectures. I mean, make these interesting models and they'd have motors and stuff like that. I need 3D print them. Uh, but he, and I was talking to a studio technician and he liked to work in Maya. Um, and Maya is more for visual effects and video games and things like that. So no, it's really not a hard surface modeling program, but he just liked the, the, how it was and the tools and how he could be creative in it. And then he'd have to hand it to his studio technicians and they'd have to take his creations and sort of make them 3D print ready, make them watertight, make sure there wasn't some impossible overhang or something like that. And then it would go to print. Um, so it was quite interesting because, you know, that these were the creative tools that he wanted to use, but it would have to go through a pipeline uh, to make it possible to be physically fabricated. Um, uh, probably because of, like I work a lot or like I model like every day um, in, in 3D files and like big 3D files that are like over like four gigs uh, in one file. Um, I think there, when I sometimes when I receive files from 
other guys that work in the like the same level i really recognize um how the files are built and uh or at the language in there and uh, i think it was like two or three years ago i received like the, you know like the, the the stl file like the the polygon structure in a in a file like in a in a printing file so i talk about like the the triangles that the file is made the mesh um was kind of like a mandala um style and i was like freak it was kind of like the the um how can i say like the the mother of all stl files and i don't know how they made the thing uh, probably nick you you uh, were like nodding you know this file I was no like, but uh, but i sympathize with being able to identify the software someone used by the quality of their mesh that is something that i think it's changing a lot of cad software is much more capable of working with meshes these days but i would say you know like this would be a fun game to play but i bet that you could send me meshes and i could tell you what they were made in just from knowing how they deal with angles and things like that yeah yeah totally uh, especially i work a lot with uh, voxels probably you're familiar with that and um voxel is like a three-dimensional pixel um it's especially good for like uh, huge um prints if you have enough machine power and um with uh, with voxel you get kind of like a special stl file out of of your of your program and even there, you already can say uh, that somebody worked with uh, with the voxel program uh, before they exported the file. It's so interesting, this kind of like archaeology that you can get with experience where you can learn a little bit more about the artist process. So on that note, what kinds of questions should artists be, well, should museums who are collecting these artworks be asking artists? Are there any like things that wouldn't be immediately obvious that we should be asking them? Um, one of the things I particularly see that moving toward is, a, you know, Daniel, you mentioned that there's some artists really like to do their own post-processing. And so that suggests that you then need to involve the artist in the future. And then, in my experience, that's not something that is always immediately communicated during the acquisition. So just thinking about what kinds of questions you can have. Well, I think when we were first approaching this at the museum, there were these questions of like, should we acquire the original CAD files, right? But that, that also created challenge, right? Because a lot of these uh, pieces of software are very expensive, thousands of dollars, and some are free. And, you know, they, they're all over the, all kinds. There's a whole diaspora. And, and so like one could acquire the, the CAD file, but you might not have a, you know, $3,000, $5,000 license of Maya to support this one artwork. And then we could say, well, okay, just export as an OBJ, but then you might lose something, right? Like a Maya file contains a lot of different texture and possibly animation information. Well, if it wouldn't be appropriate to 3D print, but that would be the original 3D visualization. So the question is, yeah, do, do, do you acquire, do you ask for the original CAD file, uh, a more standardized file, the OBJ? And then of course the G code, because that contains all the uh, information about the tool path, uh, its infill density, its supports, and how it was printed. Um, I guess in my case, I would ask <clears throat> for all of it. But knowing that, you know, we may not have the tools to open, you know, like a CAD program that is very expensive or no longer in business. Uh, but going in the future, we may be able to reopen that through emulation or something. I think um, if you ever done with like complex artwork, reverse engineering, <laughs> I tell you, like, you're really happy if you have everything that you can have, like uh, you're from the STL, the OBJ, color information, print, like, take everything what you can get, even what we had like for breakfast. Um, I would say, like, take everything, every information um, 
the company who printed the the printer the material it's really important that you have all information because uh, on the end uh, i think from like 20 specs uh, that you get um in three years i think already the half is is not existing anymore because the material is not um produced uh the printers are not existing uh, and so on and so on so um um uh, you try to avoid reverse engineering um uh, especially with with uh, complexer um, art pieces, they were like glued together. That's also if you have a lot of undercut. I went all already with uh, some pieces uh, to a CT, so uh, we did like X-ray, and it's awful. Uh, you get like uh, thousands of uh, hundreds of gigabytes of of data uh, just to do a, a small piece and uh, know how how uh, the whole thing was built. So uh, please collect everything <laughs> what you can get from the artist. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, the, the Beyond Bling show, um, as part of that exhibit, um, the curator did uh, reach out to the artists that were um, still alive or, or the artists, you know, foundations and things to um, gather, uh, survey as much information of not just, you know, what uh, what materials uh, were used in the artwork, uh, whether it was 3D printed or not. Um, keep in mind that sometimes they don't know if they shipped it off to Shapeways or something like that to, to, to you know, be built. Who knows what they used? Um, they might not have that information. Um, we found that with even traditional artists, you know, they say that uh, the piece of jewelry had rubies and there were not rubies. Um, so, so that's one thing. Another thing would be to um, talk to the artists about the future, you know, um, just like we would do for any other types of artwork. How would they want it to be conserved? Do they want it to degrade in yellow because that's how they like it? Um, do, um, would it be possible if the material that they printed out of is no longer available? What kind of material would they want? What kind of resolution would they want? Would they want it to be higher resolution if the technology is already there? Lots of questions. And like Daniel said, you have to gather as much information from them as, uh, as you can while, while you can. Well, this is a good point, though, again, because there's so many different artists, and, and you know, and these objects, you know, my realms have been spanning both media arts, but also architecture and design, and architecture and design can go into, you know, companies. And so you may say, well, you know, I want this Raspberry Pi case STL. I, I'm sure Raspberry Pi would be cool with that, but like a different company might be like, no, you can have the object. And that's it. So I see that we are about 10 minutes over time here. So I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. But thank you so much to all of our speakers today for such a wonderful discussion just now and also for sharing all of your expertise and your knowledge with us. It's been a really, really informative day. Um, we will pick up on this topic again, however, on Wednesday. And uh, on Wednesday, we will be looking more at 3D printed artworks specifically as they enter the museum. And we will continue the conversation with acquisition and also some display as well. So once again, let's give a warm round of applause to all of our speakers. And then in addition to that, also to Sarah Satron and to Martina Heidwigel who've been supporting on the back end. So thank you very much. And we'll see you all on Wednesday. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Or good, good midday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Wherever you are, have a good rest of your day. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.